Well, welcome back. This is the fourth of eight videos looking at chapter one. And what we're going to do during this particular video is get into some information security uh, fundamentals. And we're going to start off with this idea of safety before security and security by obscurity, and then move into some of the other design principles like least privilege, separation of duties, and transitive risk. Well, let's start here with safety before security and the idea as you might imagine, is we want people to be safe uh, before they're secure. They're actually related. There are things that you can do in security uh, that threaten safety, and you've just got to think through that process. Make sure that people are actually safe in their operating environment before you start securing that environment. The second is this idea of security by obscurity. And you can see that in the, the uh, kind of uh, cartoon over there, for a long time within our industry, uh, we would uh, try to come up with these, uh, security systems and then not share them with anyone under the idea that if we could keep that secret, uh, then we could uh, provide a secure system. And that's generally not true. Um, it, 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 it's generally a poor mechanism, uh, and it is not a design principle uh, associated with security systems. Instead, what you want to be able to do is build systems where the entire architecture of the system is public, uh, but that uh, the key, whatever private key you're using, uh, remains uh, confidential, and by doing so, the entire system cannot be cracked as long as that private key is protected. So that's an example of the types of security systems and design. So as, as we go through the models that you're going to see later in this course, they're all very public. They've all been publicly vetted. A lot of the encryption systems and security systems, the idea is to publicly vet them and let everybody look at them and explore if there are flaws in the system rather than uh, this myth that security by obscurity actually works. All right, so let's start to move into uh, this idea of, uh, of design principles, real design principles. And we're going to start with that first one of least privilege. And basically what that's saying is that don't do something unless you need to do it, and if you do so, do it at the lowest possible permission level. So even though you can, on your uh, computer, work as either a user or an administrator or a super user, um, do you really need to be in uh, a super user or root or administrative user uh, role to read your email or to do other things? And so the idea is do things at the lowest possible permission uh, and privilege level and only escalate if you absolutely have to be running um, at that higher privileged level. And this talks about uh, the going back and looking at patching and uh, the vulnerabilities that were mitigated when you remove administrative rights on uh, devices and allow only the technicians to have those rights. And this drives people crazy. But what it means is they can't download and install malware. Um, and so you, you're seeing a 64% uh, reduction in the uh, types of attacks that you could have that were immediately mitigated. And while that's a little bit controversial, uh, what's not controversial is the principle. The principle of least privilege is important. And when you're doing certain things, as I said, if you're a database administrator and you need to be uh, running as a super user to do certain things, be a super user to do those certain things. But when you return back to web browsing, when you return to reading your email and doing uh, lower privileged tasks that a general user would use, be logged in as the user, not as the super user. Uh, and that allows you to protect the underlying systems because they can't take advantage of those elevated uh, privilege status. Now let's talk about another one. This is the, the idea that there is no silver bullet that in fact you have levels within levels within levels of protection. You may start all the way on that outside, looking at the, the graph on the left, uh, the blue area where you've got policies and procedures. That awareness refers to training, awareness training and education programs. And that around that you may have some physical security. Uh, you may have some perimeter security. Then you have the internal network security the actual host or, uh, security or the computer uh, security, application security, and then data security. So this idea of a defense in depth 
is what uh, makes our security systems work. And you'll talk, we'll talk a little bit later on in the course when we get into security controls, how these security controls work together to provide this holistic protection. So again, as I started the discussion, there is no silver bullet. There is no one thing uh, that will defeat all possible security attacks. Instead, uh, most modern systems build a defense in depth uh, that is very multifaceted and allows uh, so that the, the, the risk can be reduced through the application of all of these different controls. All right, next is this idea of separation of duties, the idea that for certain high, uh, very critical tasks, let's say you're going to launch nuclear weapons. You've all seen it in the movies where they've got two people that have keys and both people have to turn the keys at the same time. That's an, ex that's an idea. That's an example of separation of duties. Two people are required for the nuclear launch code. But that actually applies with an IT a lot. So sometimes when you're looking for insider attacks, you may have a code review process. You may have a change management process to make sure that malware, bugs, viruses don't get into production systems. And that requ requires more than one person reviewing the code or reviewing the changes uh, to make sure that we don't have an error occur and we don't have fraud occur uh, within the particular system. So we've talked about least privilege, we've talked about separation of duties, let's now move in and talk about transitive risk. And the idea behind transitive risk is that you've got to look at the system uh, overall and look at the different components of the system to see is there someone involved uh, that has lower security and a lower sensitivity and then that induces uh, their lack of security on your system. So if you look at the target break-in uh, a couple of years ago, that's a great example. There was a vulnerability in a third party through a point of sales. Uh, device and then that cause, that transitive risk was transmitted from the third party to Target. They didn't talk about the third party company in all the news stories, they talked about Target. And that's because Target inherited that risk from that third party. So again, that's an example of uh, uh, another one of uh, transitive risk and another one of these design principles. So as we've talked about least privilege and we've talked about transitive risk and separation of duties and the uh, uh, importance there, it's important to go back and look at kind of the modern security challenges. And most of these should not come as a surprise to you. We have this kind of blending of corporate and personal lives, which means we have to shift what we're doing within our environment to secure and manage the risk of that environment. We often have a uh, inconsistent enforcement of policies, and we have poorly written policies. It takes a PhD in security to understand. Uh, there are no action verbs, and you just leave the policy baffled as to what is normal, what is not normal, what should I do. Uh, if you go back to the 80s, uh, IT uh, owned and controlled all the devices. That is no longer true. Uh, with the plethora of personal uh, computing devices, be it a cell phone, a tablet, uh, people bringing their uh, computing devices to work or working from home, um, there is not that degree of control. It used to be all of IT was in the same company. Now a lot of it is outsourced, leading to opportunities for transitive risk, and it, it requires a different approach to addressing that security. Uh, that uh, gets to that kind of bottom bullet there, that idea of blurring of internal and external uh, resources. Because of the richness of different mechanisms by which we interact, um, covert channels for attacks become, or second order consequences related to the relationships between very complex IT systems uh, the, it becomes uh, where it's not obvious, okay? And so uh, because of this, you, you have these covert channels for attack that are not obvious uh, that you have to protect against and requires a holistic understanding of how the, all the different pieces fit together, and it's quite complex. And then finally, it's a moving target. Uh, security attacks are locked because there's real money involved in compromising security systems measured in the billions, if not trillions, of dollars a year. And so because of that, uh, you have to address, you, you have to adjust 
and you have to be nimble on your feet. It, it's all in the um, reflexes, if you will, in responding to this and the anticipation, the planning. And so that's why uh, security is a thriving industry right now. That's why uh, there will be jobs in security for the foreseeable future. It is a moving target. All right, well, that brings us to the end of the uh, fourth of eight videos that are looking at risk management in Chapter 1 uh, within this course. Hope you've enjoyed that. What we're going to do next class is move and talk about a external research paper looking at risks of risk-based security, and we're going to look at a, a Don B. Parker uh, paper. So uh, keep on studying and look forward to seeing you in the next video.